Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Nyson here on our Sunday night, stormy weather outside, but that doesn't stop us rolling through this tease, uh, 2021 season previews. Benji and I embarked upon this mission because we, I don't know why, we did the Israel one kind of because we wanted to troll, I think, about how Dan Martin and Mike Woods are going to be put in a sticky situation in the Tour de France. And then we realised when people really liked it, aka you listening, that now we have to do every single World Tour team one. We're going to do every <laughs> single Women's World Tour team. And then we, Benji looked at the calendar and was like, you realise there's actually not that much time. <laughs> so now we're recording like four a weekend and churning them out. But if you appreciate it, if you like it, drop a like on the YouTube channel, the video of the uh, the video on the YouTube channel, the pod, or if you're listening on a, on a podcast player, follow us on the Lantern Roof Cycling Podcast Twitter handle, which Benji is kindly put together and and running because Benji actually knows how social media works and and can do it whereas I am pretty much full boom mode and I uh, need my hand held in all regards in that sense but yeah how you going Benji what have you been up to this weekend I know it's uh snowy in uh, Flanders yeah it's been a it's been a pretty harsh weather it's been snowing for like two three days now which is kind of unusual it, it's been like three years since I I think I've seen proper snow Two years, perhaps. Me too. Um, but I haven't come outside since it started snowing. So I haven't had to come outside since it started snowing. So that's that's always fun. I've been inside uh, recording podcasts with you, doing some stuff for our socials and stuff. And yeah, quite a, quite a relaxed weekend, I'd say. But we're not here to talk about my weekend. We're here to talk about one of the World Tour teams, right? Team Bike Exchange. Yeah, World Tour on paper. Team Bike Exchange, they've changed name because obviously it's cycling and having continuity of brand is a bit too much to ask for. So just so every Australian who casually follows cycling in January at the Tour Down Under, etc., can be more confused, Mitch and Scott, formerly Orica Green Edge, are now Team Bike Exchange. For you Europeans, Americans and Brits, which is like 93% uh, or, or non-Australians who listen to the podcast, and I'm not missing out on New Asia, you form a pretty high part of the pod too. Non-Australians, t- bike exchanges are, I'm not sure if it is overseas, but it's, it's an online retailer of bikes or like an aggregator for bike shops and stuff. Not describing it very well. Pretty sure it's owned by Harvey, who own, owns Jayco, who f- sponsored and might still sponsored by Jayco AIS, like an Australian development team. Um, and sponsors Australian races, so and co-owns uh, Mitchell and Scott, and now Team Bike Exchange. So they're the sole name sponsor. I'm not seeing their their bikes are pretty nice, aren't they, Benji? What are they on now? They on they've changed from the, Bianchi. They've changed from the C. What were they on Scotts to Scott. Bianchi? Yes, and um, oh, actually, it, no, no. who's on Scott, who's on Scott now? DSM? I don't know. No clue. I think there was a musical chairs between Jumbo, Mitchelton, and DSM, between Bianchi, Cervelo, I'm, and Scott. And yeah, I know that Jumbo is on Cervelo now, and DSM are on Scott. Bike Exchange is on Bianchi, so DSM has to be on Scott. Yeah, so they all swapped around. And, yeah, Bike Exchange, the new kit, eh, not a massive fan of it, to be honest. But they have... Got more wins. We're going to go through their wins first and look at their transfers, then pick their squads or who we think is strong or weak for the various uh, races like Cobbles, Grand Tours, Ardennes. You know how this works now. You know the rules. But in 2020, they won 16 races. Now, oh, let me count. One, two, three. Four of them were national championships races. Obviously, Mitchell and Scott, as they were then, uh, they got a team up and win the Australian National Championships. They duly did that with Cameron Meyer, making sure that the Australian National Championships jersey went on the back of someone who would never be seen in a World Tour race uh, at the front of it in 2020, making sure that that was good for their branding. And then, yeah, Jacob Herald's Sun Tour, Caden Groves cleaned up a couple of the sprints, young Australian sprinter. And then Haig won that lockdown. Oh, sorry, before lockdown, Haig won that uh Andalusia stage against a sprint against Fulsang and Landa. And then Adam Yates was really, really strong at the UAE Tour, which was just right before lockdown kicked in and COVID kicked off properly. He won won that stage, put like a fair bit of time into Tade Pagacha, I think, and then won GC at the UAE Tour. Then 
They won, I think, after lockdown. The main results were two stages at Torreno, one with Lucas Hamilton uh, when I think he was went clear with Fausto Masnada in stage four, and then Simon Yates won stage five and the overall. And then I think Dion Smith won at Coppa Sabatini, which is a one pro race. So five World Tour wins, three of them at Torreno. How do you rate their season, Benji? I mean, 16 wins, it's pretty good. It's better than a lot of the teams we have reviewed, but is it about par? I'd say it's a I'd say it's just under par. Not a disaster, but we've expected more from Bike Exchange or Mitchelton Scott in, in previous years, especially at Grand Tours, right? They won a lot in regards to those 16 days, but I feel like it's still under par as well because those races were relatively qualitative with UAE and Tirreno, but outside of those, the others were not really what a World Tour team should be winning. And I think that's mainly due to the fact that in the likes of a Giro, they had Simon Yates' leader, had backfired with his COVID problem in the end, and obviously that kind of threatened the entire team for the Giro. They tried to go in breakaways from that point onwards and try to do some, uh, some stuff to still bring home victories, but didn't work in the Giro. In the Vuelta, they started with um, your boy Esteban Chavez as leader. It's not my boy. Now, um, it's not my boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's not your boy then. Someone's boy, Esteban Chavez at the start. And looking at the last years of Chavez, I have no clue why they still go for him as leader. I don't believe in Chavez as GC leader anymore. It's been how long? Five years since he competed at a top level in GC? Oh, yes. And yes, he had injuries. He had lots of injuries. But there's got to be a point where you say, this is enough. It's it's just not great to watch anymore. The man's probably on a decent salary and he's not he's not performing up to standards. And I don't know how they haven't realized that yet and how they haven't switched that around yet. Because I'd much rather put my eggs in the basket of Lucas Hamilton at the start of La Vuelta. Because I see more potential growth in Lucas Hamilton than in Esteban Chavez, who is kind of washed. Yeah, I mean, if you think we're being harsh, those 16 wins, and I know there were races cancelled, but the Grand Tours and the big races weren't cancelled. I want you to remember how strong their Ardennes squad was when they had Matthews, Gerrans, Impey and Co. back in the sort of 2015-16 region. But as not far back as 2018, 33 wins... Yes, there's the Australian ones and the South African ones with Impey and Co. at the start. But that included winning the Vuelta overall and, let me count, four stages, five stages at the Giro d'Italia and a stage at the Vuelta in addition to winning the GC overall. And I'm trying to count quickly, but I'm looking at over 12, 13 more World Tour wins, um, not counting Guangxi in that list, in 2018. 2019, I think 35 wins again, and that included four Tour de France stage wins. It included, I think, Paris ITT, uh, a Giro stage win with Esteban Chavez, who I don't think is, uh, I don't think he's like washed, but I think GC wise, it's it's a it's not a conversation worth having. I think it's going for. Uh, stages is where he's at now at this point in his career but yeah you look at those results and then 2020 just i don't know what happened benji i mean i know well i do know what happened i mean there was a there's a 90 minute period and i know because i lost uh, a fair bit of money <laughs> i'm not afraid to admit that when the Geraint thomas news came out that he crashed in the giro stage uh i obviously then called up my broker and put on a fair bit of money on Simon Yates, who then promptly went into heavy, heavy favourite for the Giro d'Italia. He'd cleaned up Terreno, looked the best rider there in terms of the GC guys by far. And, um, yeah, he was the favourite for about, yeah, 90 minutes. And then he started dropping. And he obviously had COVID. So that's not his fault. It's not really anyone's fault. It's just really, really unfortunate. I hope he's better. I hope he hasn't. he's not suffering from any long-term effects from that. I haven't really read too much about it and his recovery. Understandably, a lot of riders keep this sort of thing private. But I hope he's fine. And But, yeah, that really kind of waylaid their Giro and then it went through the team and then they had to pull out. So I'm not going to criticise them too much about the Giro d'Italia. 
Tour de France, Benji, who did they who did they send to the Tour de France and the Vuelta? What was their plans there last year? Well, Mezgic. they had Charles at the um, – Mezgic was at the Tour de France, yes. Yeah. Um, but they were at they – were, they were there as well with Adam Yates. He started off pretty well, ended up oh, in yellow at a certain point. four days point. in yellow. Yep, four days in yellow for Yates. Yep. So uh, we can't forget that aspect, yeah. but the problem with Yates was that he's a one-week stage racer. And when it comes to recovery over long days, he ends up – falling off the back after two, three weeks, and he's unable to compete with the big guns then in the climbing. So that's where Adam Yates was was weaker at, and it didn't really pay off too much in the end because they had to make that decision, remember, in the Tour de France, where they could either choose to try and defend his yellow as much as possible or his fifth, fifth spot at, as much as possible at a certain point, or they could decide to go and pull him back a tiny bit, try and gain more time so that he could try and get a stage win in the third or second week of the Tour de France. And I think they made the decision to switch to that second strategy a bit too late, which caused it to be um, kind of stuck in top 10. And that is mainly the reason why I think they didn't get as many victories, because if Adam Yates was not in a position where he had to defend GC, then he would have gotten into breakaways and he would have relatively easily beaten a lot of these breakaway riders on the uh, higher mountain stage because he's quite simply better than most breakaway riders. And I think that's where they lost a few victories on a very top level, the sort of France. There's a few other warning signs that have come out for me with Team Bike Exchange, and it's not just the the funding issues. I mean, th- think about it from a human perspective. Last year they had the Manuela Fundacion sort of debacle, yeah. very, very embarrassing for all involved. Uh, I know there was... Um, like those guys and girls, w- women were not being paid or being paid not very much for a lot of the season. They had serious funding issues um, and financial pressures for most of those riders at uh, Bike Exchange. I'm not sure if they've been topped up again or what happened. Uh, and that's not unique to, to those guys. That happened throughout everyone, not just in the cycling world, but a lot of people with COVID, etc. But that's not going to exactly... The, the the unique thing about cycling was is these guys getting paid nothing or twenty percent of what they're contracted to were still expected to train. They were still expected to prepare for races. Whereas when you get if you got laid off in Australia, um, you'd apply for a job uh, social security or something, you still weren't expected to turn up to the job every day and not get paid. <laughs> like that that's what didn't make sense to me uh, mm-hmm. and it's kind of was quite unfair about it for the cyclists. It's not like football where, oh, you know, football you just keep in relatively good shape, right? Whereas cyclists, you've got to train, you've got to train hard out and I think, yeah, that, that would have just been very difficult psychologically for a lot of those guys. And a lot of these guys as well, track guys, maybe they were focusing on Tokyo as well. It was supposed to be an Olympic year. Then there were some other things that concerned me. I think Matt White, I think, has been good and is heralded heralded as a reasonably smart guy and I mean, he's come across okay in some of the, a lot of the social media stuff that Oric have done and the backstage stuff. But then, I don't know, there's been a few things where he's chosen, he, he's put his eggs in, in one basket that I think is the wrong basket to be putting your eggs in. Chavez, we've already mentioned. I think Lucas Hamilton's clearly his vision for the future as well as he's picked him over Haig, obviously. Um, Haig didn't really get many opportunities, I don't think. Um, and, yeah, Hamilton seems to be the guy for the future. And then also he's talking about, I think he did an interview where he, he said Roglic is going to put a minute into Pagaccia in each of the time trials next year in the Tour de France. And that's, uh, I mean, listen, maybe he doesn't really think about it and, who you know, what does it matter to him? But, um well, I don't agree with that. <laughs> that statement. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Benji doesn't either. But yeah. getting into their transfers, Benji, their outgoing riders. Albacini retired, Swiss legend, uh, great in the Ardennes, great all-round rider. Adam Yates gone over to to uh, Ineos. We've already spoken about that. The big one, I think, that I want to talk about is 
Impey. So Haig has gone to Bahrain for his own opportunities. Uh, makes sense for Haig and probably makes sense for Mitchton, to be honest, because um, they're going with Hamilton. Afini's gone to Jumbo Visma as a bit of an engine, the Italian TT guy. But Daryl Impey leaving, Benji, how does that – would you have been – okay letting him go with Matthews coming back? I think it's a weird one because they work so well together and their type of rider fits so well together as well. The moment that Matthews gets over a hill to try and get for a sprint, Impey's also still there and could lead him out. So they are compatible with each other quite perfectly for winning harder sprint stages. And I think that Next to that, Impey's also not the rider that is worthless outside of that. He can get in breakaways and be competitive compared to others in Grand Tours. And we've seen that quite a few times. I think he's won Grand Tour stages that way. So um, all in all, it's it's a bit surprising that he goes. He's also not going to like a top team that pays super much. He's going to Israel Startup Nation. I don't well kind of an exception with Froome there. <laughs> they don't pay too much, $5 million. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think he was definitely getting, is definitely getting paid better at Israel. He, uh, he'd have to yeah. be, right? Yeah. Then uh, yeah. Mitch, Mitch and Bowl, a uh, uh, bike exchange, given their funding issues. I mean, I'd be very, very, very surprised if it wasn't the case. But like Daryl Impey, in, from 2017 to date, he's won six World Tour stages. That is like that's a serious rider. That's six world tour stages in in that period. Like there's actually for a guy who's not thought of as a top guy and o- often is helping other riders, um, that's a really good return, including a Tour de France stage and a Dauphiné stage in that list too. He obviously also helped Matthews a lot back in the day when Matthews was first at Mitch and Scott when it was Orica Green Edge. Impy was in that Ardennes squad. I think he helped Matthews get that Giro Maglia Rosa back in the day. They had a really good connection. And that's why I think me and you were laughing, Benji, in the Israel preview when he was described as a super domestique and we were like, we, we yeah. think that the same rider? Like Daryl Impey is uh, like a, uh, an ideal domestique for a puncher in all, all races except like Flesh. Or even in Flesh, he's probably pretty handy on at the start if you needed him to be. And Dauphiné stage one, second behind Wout Van Aert on that punchy finish in 2020. So he's still got it, but he's not a mountain domestique. He is not. So, yeah, they must, I don't know, maybe I, I actually, we don't know. We didn't have the answer for it then. We don't have it now. <laughs> there we are. Maybe they're actually big braining and they're like, put him with Mike Woods and Dan Martin, and that's a great combination for the Ardennes. So, yeah, that would work. But anyway, onto the riders they've signed. Michael Matthews, we'll get to in a second. But what do you think of the signings of Kangert and Armand Grundol Janssen Benji? I think Kangert is the kind of rider that um, could definitely be a good add on for the team. He is, first of all, decent at those Verona type late ground tour time trials. He can get a top 15 or top 10 in those areas. But you don't sign a rider to get top 10, top 15s in time trials, in my honest opinion. So you got to get something out of someone else. And Tanel Kangard was a really good domestique when he was riding for Vincenzo Nibali in the Giro of 2016. I think that Kangard is an underrated domestique regarding the mountains. He can perform really well. And it wouldn't have surprised me that if the world turned out differently, that Kangard ended up transferring between 2016 and 2017 to Ineos and would be a really important, decent domestiques in that team because he's got the um, the integrity and the strength to to be one of that one of those train riders obviously now with their nine gc riders it's kind of getting difficult to be in that squad but i think kangert's really underrated on that area but he's also good at those really punchy climbs there was that giro stage where um no tireno stage this year in 2020 where um they had a small climb something with pontani a, a, a pretty steep climb, and he was one of the uh, five to six riders that got over that in firsts. So I think he's a bit underrated in that area as well. I don't think he can lead a team. He needs to have it from the domestique area, but there are so many things he can be a domestique at. So I think he's a good signing. Janssen as well, I think he's very supportive for, well, the signing that you mentioned earlier, Michael Matthews, in the gobble season. Ah, but and, what? 
there's a problem with that, and that's why Armand Grundal Janssen left Jumbo Visma, and apparently it was for his own opportunities. Hmm. Which, again, I, it doesn't make sense to me. The results that he has, fifth of Britannia Classic in 2019, well, who won Britannia Classic handily in 2020? Michael Matthews. And Benji, I'm not so familiar with them, but his other good results are at ZLM Tour, uh, Gukshipail, Trevenkers, Overreisha. What what sort of races are they? Are they like Britannia Classic? Uh, they're they're a bit under it when it comes to the quality of the races and but I mean, in I, um, parkour. Is it like? Is it more like Flanders yeah, or is it more like Hendvabelham or is it more like Britannia? It's a combination Classic? between um, between cobbles flat stages. Yep. And like county level cobble races, those kind of races, um, they change parkour every so often. So I have to make sure I, I cover every detail there. But so the reason you're on, you have to know every single Belgian Europe tour <laughs> parkour for the last five years. Off is it a left tour is in the Netherlands, man? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Either way, I think that Janssen can very much offer a offer a lot of help for Matthews if he left for his own opportunity. It might be troublesome, but the thing is, I think he's very talented as well. So yeah. it's kind of on on he both got, ends, but I really think he, he'd be better off helping Matthews, honestly. Like he, he's and, a great guy to have a draft off. 1.87 yeah. meters, like 80 kilos, big power. Like I think for Matthews, who obviously, you know, he likes having a draft. He's really good. You think in Milano San Remo, Grondal Janssen can help him? He sort of helped La Van out a bit in, yep, in for the, sure last year. Yeah. Um he was pretty important as well for Wout Van Aert on on the Pajo, keeping everything relatively together until Mr. Ala Philippe went for a, a bit of a, a solo section for a second there until Van Aert got up. So Janssen can very much help Matthews in the likes of a Milano San Remo, and I hope that they choose to do exactly that. And I hope they don't say, oh, let's let's go there with both riders. Because that's also the reason I think that Matthews left Sunweb would be that he didn't really get the support he wanted in those one-day races that were clearly set out for him, Milano San Remo and such. So therefore, I think that he would want the support of someone like Janssen in Milano San Remo. That is uh, my take on that, at least. Yeah, so Michael Matthews is the marquee signing for... Bike Exchange, you've got the wins of Adam Yates going out the door, who obviously won UAE Tour and a stage there too. And you're bringing in Michael Matthews, who he had a pretty good season. Third at Milano San Remo, nice results. Second in a Paranese stage, obviously won Britannia Classic. I mean, that wasn't the biggest World Tour stage, but still World Tour. And then to Renault, he was getting in breakaways, World Championships road race on that really hilly course seventh and then Matthews I think would have ended up winning a Giro stage Benji I mean maybe that's just my Australian bias but yeah he got second a fourth a third I think he missed the yeah. move at Agrigento when uh Ulissi went but then they obviously pulled out after stage nine I think because of the uh oh no did he DNS after stage nine why did Sunweb pull out or why did he pull out did he crash uh, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> was it? No, he wait. No, he was. He got that um COVID test, and then the day after, it was not a real COVID test. Uh, <laughs> he didn't have it, and then a week later, he did have it, and then he didn't have it. Something like that. That's why right. he was out. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah. Obviously, Sunweb didn't pull out because uh, I think Ja Hinley was still in the Giro, yeah. uh, from memory. Yeah. So. <laughs> So Matthews has gone for his own opportunities. I think it's a great move for him. I, I think it just it's he's thirty now. Say that say that he's like Greg Van Avermaet at, at thirty years old. Van Avermaet still looking for those big wins in his career, and then he had that he had a three year peak from say twenty sixteen to twenty nineteen, from like thirty to thirty three or thir- twenty nine to thirty four or whatever. I think Matthews can try and replicate that. I think there's very similar riders like, uh, you know, Montreal, not as good at, say, Tour of Flanders or Roubaix, but, yeah, similar stylish of riders. Um, Matthews, obviously, former winner of the green jersey in the Tour de France, I think, in 2017. I think he's entitled to go to a team where he can demand leadership and really see what he can do in 
yep. races like Milano San Remo, Amstel, Liège, and then go stage hunting in the Grand Tours. But yeah, what do you think? Do you think that is pretty straightforward, Benji? You think that's why they've signed him just to be like, hey, you are our leader for those races. You are our leader for stage wins in certain Grand Tours. Well, it must be. Uh, he is definitely up there with the best on his type of terrain. And if he comes to that terrain, he needs the support and he needs to get the support because he deserves it. I think uh, a fun story that I read in a Newsblood, which is like a Belgian newspaper. Um, I think you saw this as well, was that Matthews was not selected at the Omelop race at Sunweb last year because he didn't do a his homework in analyzing something about the parkour because at Sunweb, riders apparently need to uh, do part of the race analysis, bring it forward and bring their input on it so that they can decide tactics and such. And we obviously don't know whether that article is is completely true, but it sound, it just sounds awful. And I think that he's going to be in much better place either way in... in uh, in Mitchelton, because quite simply, I think he looked a bit frustrated at Sunweb, if I have to be really honest. Now, going from Matthews to the last man on the list, Kevin Colleoni, he's got the name of a Mafia Kingpin, but he isn't <laughs> that. He's got talent, though, very much. He was 15 U23 ITT championships in Italy, but mainly third in the Giro U23 behind Pitcock and Henry van der Nabele. Henry van der Nabele, who is now at a lot of Sudal? Nope. He's at Dev Team DSM, of course. They stole him. And um, he's going to Team DSM in 2022. So he's one of those top three riders. So he must be pretty good at climbing for sure. You analyze the um, U23 Giro better. Have you noticed Kevin Colleoni there? And do you think he's got solid potential as a GC rider? I mean, this is like what I said in the uh, Trek Segafredo preview. I mean, he's got nice-ish results in other races too. Like, he's not not just done okay at Baby Giro, um, but you know my view. If you, if they're not the if they're not the out and out top top guy, like a Pagacha, Bernal, even Sosa, even a Pole, etc. At junior level, even Brenner, like then or Pidcock, for example, then I probably. Like I don't understand the point of a two year deal, Benji. Like what explain the rationale for a two year deal for Colleoni. So if he's if he's no good, which like he's likely not going to be cleaning up world tour races, then you you've just signed him a twenty one year old for two years and he's not really going to do much and you're just developing him when you're in world tour trying to get good results. Um now, maybe you think he can be good enough to help uh, Simon Yates on GC. May, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure about that, though. But if he's really good, well, then he's going to be leaving after two years or demanding yeah. a massive salary. So it's kind of – I don't understand the two-year deal. I, the, fi- the four- or five-year deal for the Ayuso, I think, at UAE, for Brenner at Sunweb, although he'll probably do well and then they'll kick him out, but – you get my like. What? Why? What? Why would you sign up for two years? What's the rationale, Benji? I think I've got the same opinion as you. You've got the fact that if he, if he's not good enough, then they're gonna ditch him after two years. If he's good enough, then he's likely going to leave. If he's average, I think that's the most ideal situation for Mike Exchange because then he might be able to stay within the team because he might be better than. Half of the riders there, but he won't be an all-out favorite in any of the races. He will be a supportive character. That's the only situation in which I see Bike Exchange keeping this man after two years, unless they've got a very amazing relationship after two years, and it's more a human choice than a financial choice. But despite people uh, saying that a lot, I still think money is what makes transfers happen. And I believe if the money comes knocking with Jumbo and Ineos, once he wins a World Tour race in in his second year at Bike Exchange, then he's going to be leaving at the end of the year. Yep, and if he's kind of average or no good, then Trek Segafredo will say, have a four-year contract to uh, not do very much for us, uh, given that you're Italian. But anyway, on to the team for or who we would pick for the Cobbled Classics. Um, what, what do you think, Benji? Do you think uh, Luca Mezgetz 
he's 32 years old now. You think he could go well there? Do you think, like, on loop, would they send Matthews? I don't know. Who would be – who would they be sending there? Will they – like, they got so many Australians on this team that, I don't know, will will Maya even go to those races? If he's got Tokyo, I'm not sure if he's doing Tokyo. Durbridge, I don't know. I think on paper it's Grundal Janssen's the, their best cobbled guy, right? Yeah, I think it's going to be a combination between Grundal Janssen and Matthews. I don't think Matthews is going to ride all of the cobbled races. And the ones that he doesn't ride is where Janssen might see his opportunity as a leader in the squad. Durbridge is there as well for a supportive character. Durbridge had like one or two good years in cobbled races. That was, um, I remember Tridaxi broke the pony where he was really competitive with Lutsenko there as well. But either way, um, he's definitely going to be in those races. I think outside of those characters, it's hard to find someone that is really up there as well. Bauer is going to ride them supportively. I think that the likes of Yul Jensen could be riding them supportively as well. I'm not sure about this Konashev character. I remember he was pretty talented and he rode to Flanders, I think. Yes, his results were top 80s. I don't think that's too much, but he got 58 at envelope, so he's probably going to be selected either way for the team. Like you said, Mezgetz is one of the riders I would send to uh, the likes of an Omlop. I think he could get through that race. And he was 23rd at Tour of Flanders, so definitely worth it to put Mezgetz as uh, one of the top three riders in your couple races. It depends on who you send, obviously, but I'd have Matthews, Mezgetz, and most importantly, Janssen there. Yeah, I don't think they're a particularly strong cobble team. I think they're going to be much better in the uh, in the Ardennes this year. I'm just looking through now. Yeah, I can't really. I mean, Mezgetz, yeah, probably be at least he's actually got a very quick finish. So if maybe if it's yep. a hand Vavelham or a slow on loop, then he could go okay. Dion Smith. I mean, why he's couldn't? Decent at it. Like, why couldn't Dion Smith go well at those races? Like, he should, right? Like, oh, actually, he came 12th on the Heraldsbergen stage at Pink Bank. Oh, yeah, true. Yes, yes correct. Dion, Dion Smith has all the, like, characteristics of a rider that should do fairly well in those stages. The, prob- the problem is, like, the depth in across the world tour in those races, not only just – like Yves Lampart and Van der Poel and Juan Bernard and Pedersen, the top guys. But then you got like Stefan Kung, Soren Kray Anderson, called Brelli even at like Brabantje Pale or uh, some Bink Bank stages. Oliver Narsen is still better than Dion Smith in such races. Even like then you've got sure. Seneschal. And even like, say, Garcia Cortina improves. He's probably got a higher ceiling than Dion Smith. It's just, it's so hard. I probably missed someone too. But it's so hard to be up there in those races um, um, if you're not a top, top guy. And 12th is a pretty good result. So I expect him to be in that team uh, as well and then go to the Italian Cup races later in the season, Dion Smith. Uh, but I think it gets a lot simpler for Milano San Remo. It's Matthews as the leader, right? Yes, but I think that it was Dion Smith as well who was uh, sixth at Milano San Remo. Yeah. Right. So um, what do you say to him? Are you going to say like, oh, you got six in Milano San Remo, now Matthews is here, so uh, get out. Uh, you know, <laughs> how did you do that? It's going to be like Garrett and Matthews at Liège every time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but the thing about it is... I'm not saying that Smith is as bad as Garrett's was then, but, um, <laughs> but maybe, yeah, it, it, exactly, Benji. You've got two guys there and and the problem is right the problem is that smith is exactly the same style of rider as matthews in terms of riding milano san remo it's not like he's julio ciccone or like a nibali that the, the you know the way nibali won from milano san remo complements michael matthews can attack on the poggio matthews can sit in and wait uh and force the other teams to work whereas both Matthews and Smith are the same sort of guy. So, Rob Stannard. Yeah. Can he attack on the Pajo? He got 26 in Milano San Remo 2020. I mean, I believe in it. 
Yeah, I think he's not? got the capabilities and the and the type of rider to do it. But they won't uh, want him. To. Got, what? Sorry, they won't want him to. They want him to set pace. Yeah, I think so as well. I think they've got a, a real problem regarding Milan and Rama. I think Matthews should be all out leader still. On paper, he can get the highest result more consistently, more likely than the others in the team. And I think they need to kind of decide on that because. You can have Matthews as a leader and the rest supportive. I don't know how you're going to get everybody else to be like, oh, I'm going to ride for Matthews, but I feel like you have to. And I think that will only benefit the team. In a race like Milano and Remo, it's not really possible to say, oh, we're going to wait and we're going to keep two people in the group and we're not going to respond to an attack of Alaphali because, well, our riders are both not good enough to do that and they don't want to work for each other. So we're going to just stick in the group and hope that it settles down after the project so we can start then deciding who will be our leader. But if one of those two ends up riding for Matthews on the Pojo to try and keep Matthews in a good position, then it's more likely that Matthews will be in the uh, in the podium position at the end. So, yeah, yeah I think they so, need to work for Matthews. So he had them helping him in 2020. Maybe he would have been able in a better position to respond, like where Kwiatkowski was in a better position to respond to Alvanard and Julian Alaphilippe instead of being like he was in a bad position, got squeezed, went into the wall, still came third. That's their San Remo squad. In terms of uh, Liège, Flesch, I think they actually might go for uh, Nick Schultz, might go for Flesch. I'm not sure Matthews yep. is, suits Flesch. I mean, Adam – oh, sorry, I'm missing Simon Yates. Has he done well at Flesch or those races? I mean, I don't know. I think that you're right on, on Matthews, though. I don't think he fits at Flesh. Liege, possibly, to be honest, with the new parkour finishing Liege, that means it's a flat finish, but it also has a lot of competition, Liege. So it will need to fall ideally for Matthews to be able to compete for a victory, so it's likely for a top 10 spot. And if you look at the rest of the team, well, first of all, Amstel, I think Matthews could do well at Amstel. I think he's done it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he's done well uh, before. Definitely possible. And we, we can't forget this dude at Tirreno climbing like how he did there, uh, battling it out for KOM and such with the likes of Carretero. That's not super easy. Definitely for a rider like Matthews, and the man did it. So he's got potential on hilly parkours as well for certain. We've seen him have good results at the likes of LBL. So Matthews should be in that team. Simon Yates, the problem with Simon Yates is that I think he... um. He said he's doing both the Giro and the Tour. So uh, good luck doing that and the Hill Classics before that. So I don't see that happening on that basis. Nick Schultz should be riding LBL, in my opinion. He was 18th at Amstel, if I recall correctly, 2020th or 22nd at Flesh, something like that. That's not perfect, Schultz, is but Schultz is improving. He's, he's improving to be a useful rider, and he can definitely be useful in, in the Ardennes. Yeah, Rob Stannard. Uh, we didn't mention him too much on the cobble thing, but the man got 14 in Kunibrus-Lekuren, apparently. Um, the thing about Stannard is, we've got Hill Classics, like Amstel stuff, and we've also got the Italian Classic, the Italian Cup Hill Classics. In those Italian Cup Classics, second in Toscane, third in Apennino, eighth in Piemonte. Those are similar races, but the competition is a bit less. A bitch less, <laughs> a bit less, <laughs> and um, in the end, I think that if he translates that, if he translates that to the hill classics, then he can be really worth it to send to the likes of Amstel and stuff as well. Because I think he can perform there. He just wasn't sent to it yet. So I'm extremely curious what Rob Standard can do in those situations. They've got solid talent amongst the Australians in their squad, but they've also got a few Australians where I wonder. Do they still need to be in a World Tour team? But yeah, yeah I mean, we be, uh... Uh, and when you say that, I agree with you there. I'm not talking about uh, like Damien Housen and Michael Hepburn. I think they're still, you know, they're they're useful. They're under 30. They they're still when you need them to go to the front of a race at Amstel or wherever early in, in the early stages. They're still really good. But yeah, there's some guys there that I'm you're seeing that, um, like Cam Meyer. I don't know what. <laughs> What's the point? Um, like it seems like his focus is not really on World Tour on the road. And then even 
there's the young guys like Lucas Hamilton, Benji. He's 24. He's been at Nicholson Scott since 2018. He's never done Liège. He's done one Lombardia. Um, it, it's really a weird program where they're not getting, and that was this year or last year rather. So like in 2019, he was still not sent to like any of the hilly classics. Um, he was sent to Montreal and Quebec then. And then again in 2018, he was not sent to – he went to Le- – uh, sorry, he did flesh and he DNF'd, so maybe he crashed. Um, but they also sent him to Omloop and Kerner Russell Kerner. So, yeah, there's not much experience with the younger guys in those races. That's why I think um, – Nick Schultz should definitely be on that team list. Barnabas Peak maybe as well could be pretty good in those races if he improves. He's only 22, the Hungarian. But yeah, Simon Yates, I don't think he's not at his peak yet. Not at his peak yet. <laughs> okay, so that's how it's going to be. Is it? We're going to be, we're going to be cracking. <laughs> that was offline. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably have him. In that squad too, he's done, you know, he's done five Milano San Remo, four Liège. He's just a consistent, <laughs> comic um, experienced guy. But, yeah, it's all about Matthews, and I guess that's why they've signed him. Um, so I'm not being critical when I'm saying they don't have lots of options. I think it's better it's better to just have a clear option who actually could win the race than have, like, three guys who really are just kind of fighting for 10th. Do you agree with that or not? Completely agree, and I think that's where Matthews comes in in a lot of the occasions. With the Hill Classics, that's a bit less. I think the races where three riders trying to go for 10th yeah, comes in handy as those Italian Cup Classics. Amstel, he's, he's coming in top three in Amstel, 100%. Yep, okay. That's your uh, not-so-hot hot take, okay. Yeah, outside of that, I think um, those are kind of the names we drop when it comes to the Hill Classics. When it comes to Gangard. Do we expect something in the likes of the Hill Classics there? We know the man hasn't really ridden them too much, but I think he has got a top 30 somewhere in LBL, 2019 oh. top 32. Uh, 40, 40 fast. Supportive character, perhaps. That is uh, what I've got in mind for him then at the Hill Classics. Either way, I think that's roughly it for the Hill Classics. Yeah, I think we can go over to the uh, Grand Tours and I think the Giro comes into play first. Who do you send to the Giro for Team Bike Exchange? Esteban Chavez? I don't know, Benji, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it depends a lot on the parkour, right? So I think you have to send Matthews to the Tour because depending on how he's climbing, how light he is, you might either that move to Britannia stage or that uphill yep. drag. The first stage is kind of an uphill drag. Probably will be too quick for him, but yeah, maybe you eye off Matthews at the tour. I think you have to send him as your marquee signing. So that then says it's going to be Simon Yates, right? They're going to send Simon Yates to the to the Giro. Or you think they might send him for stages in the tour? I would send Simon Yates for a GC at the Giro. And yep. I, um, I think they already said that he's going to both Giro and Tour. So I'm curious what he's going to be sent to the Tour then. At the, at the Giro, it's most likely GC, knowing that we don't know the time trials yet. Everybody's like sending their GC yeah. riders who aren't good at time trial to the Giro. Yeah, and more then there's <laughs> going to be more time trial kilometers. Suddenly an announcement. Oh, 80 kilometer time trial announcements. Oh, everybody's canceling their Giro trip. <laughs> no, people are uh, uh, not, not avoiding the parkour. That's not, who, that's not what they're avoiding. They're avoiding the two. Screens. They're avoiding the people. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> um, run this, this uh, listen to this squad Christopher Yule Jansen, Damien Housen, mm-hmm. Mark Hepburn, Lucas Hamilton, Simon Yates, Mikel Nieve, uh, Luke Durbridge, and maybe Stannard or Schultz. Rather. I would, I would put Gating Groves in there as sprinter to try and jump into the uh, bunch sprints because you can't send him to the uh, Tour de France, if you sent Matthews to the Tour de France. so And he deserves to be in a Grand Tour that doesn't go to hill stages every so often like the Vuelta. So I would put Caden Groves in there for the Giro as well to give him opportunities for a sprint. Yep, fair enough. Uh, I think he... Yep, I think he's going to struggle in a Grand Tour. But, yep, 
send him why not um they got uh skabu garamai as well the ethiopian good climber so maybe i should have said he should be in there with supporting simon yates uh as well and he did he did liege and flesh last year too so maybe we should have had him on that list as well uh, but I think that team for the Yates at the Giro, that'll be a, I think I'd have him as a top. He's so inconsistent, um, notwithstanding the COVID, even as other races as well. But on his day, Simon Yates is is top class. So who knows? I mean, that's why Mitch Crudon or Bike Exchange, if it all, all goes right, they could end up with a monument, Amstel, Grand Tour stages, a Giro podium, lots of wins in the Italian Cup from the other guys. Lucas Hamilton could show out in a one-week race. Who knows? But on the other hand, it could be not a great season either. Tour de France, Benji, you going? You going with the Matthews and stage hunting with other riders? Yes, but I would also send Simon Yates to the Tour de France. And stage the reason hunting? I'm doing that. It kind of depends on the Giro, doesn't it? If he wins the Giro, then he then he can go and go stage stage hunt for me. But I think Simon Yates has a decent quality, and if everybody keeps sending everybody to the Giro, then yeah. why not try GC? Because there's gonna be like three people left, and, and Bennett. Third is still good. <laughs> yeah, like he might get a top five this way. Because yeah. not even joking, like every single rider out at a Pogacar and Roglic is shouting, "I'm going to the Giro." Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna end up in a competition with like 10 people of your your level at that point then you might not be able to give an opportunity of a victory at the Tour de France but it's going to be more likely for a bunch of those riders but yeah that's that's only my remark I guess there's a lot of people that that are agreeing with those riders that it's a good decision to go to a race without too many Time trial kilometers <laughs> is their time, excuse all the time, time but yeah. The only rider brave enough to go to the Tour de France um, to fight against his Slovenian countrymen. But yeah, I think uh, Chavez or Hamilton, maybe maybe the Tour de France is where they're like, Hamilton have a crack at GC leadership. That could be an opportunity for him. To be honest, Benji, yeah, Gomez was unlucky not to win a stage last year. He's quick. And he's he fits yeah. in the Vuelta when yeah. it comes to stages. I think yeah. gets could clean up like two or three Vuelta stages, no problem. Um, like that stage fourteen in the Tour, he got over those those rises pretty well. Like Mezgets is good; he's thirty two, but he's still really good. And yeah, I think I think they should really focus on him. As I agree, as an A priority in one of those races, um, but. Yeah, the Tour de France squad, I think it's going to be Hamilton going for GC, Matthews there as well, did have a mixed bag and probably stage hunting, which, by the way, is where Mitchton in the past and Bike Exchange have been at their fortes, going stage hunting in the Tour, getting getting jerseys, etc. So I hope they do that again. Uh, Vuelta squad, Benji, you just mentioned it. Do you think it's going to be Nieve and Mezgets and Colioni maybe and uh, Simon Yates or... Dion Smith again going for stages with Stannard. I mean, they, they got a fair few options. I definitely sent the likes of uh, a Rob Stannard and such to that race because you've got a lot of hill stage, you've got a lot of steep, hilly terrain. Rob Stannard fits with that kind of terrain. He rode the Velt already, got fifth on a stage, he got ninth on a stage, he got ninth on the last stage, which was quite generally a normal sprint. So he's a good combination between a sprinter and a puncher, and he can climb decently. So send him to the Velta, just do it again, and wouldn't surprise me if he wins a Volta stage this year if he's at the Volta, because I, I really think that Rob Sennett has potential, and I um I believe in that opportunity if he gets the opportunities from the team, and that's where it will lie, because there's a lot of riders like him on the team. We've said it, uh, for example, the Milano San Remo and Hill Classics teams. There's a lot of people in that area, in this team, and Therefore, it's difficult for Rob Stanner to get enough opportunities. And the other problem is that you've got a lot of those Italian classics during that era as well. And if you've got a lot of Italian classics around the Vuelta, then, well, the problem is going to be that Stanner also fits in those Italian classics and his type of rider also fits in those Italian classics. If you've got Matthews at the Giro, why do you not send him to the Vuelta as well? 
I believe in that. Yeah, maybe. Do you send him? I mean, Matthews is probably going to be going for the World Championships. Who's the Australian? I don't know who the Australian um, leader for the World Champs is going to be. Probably, uh, probably might be Michael Matthews. I'm sure I'm missing somebody. Um, uh, we don't know the exact parkour yet. But, yeah, I think let's go into their over under Benji and what, what season you expect from them. 33 and 35 wins in 2018, 2019. Then just the down to 16 last year and not as great a year in the Grand Tour, Grand Tours. What's your over-under? Do you think they're going to win over 23 races, professional races next year? I think they're going to... Um, I think they're going to be around that number again. I don't think it's going to be too different from the 23. I think that match is going to be the main engine behind those victories. And I think some of the... Uh, more punchy riders in in that team as well. Sam and Yates should be able to get a few victories. I think it's going to be around 23 again. I I couldn't really say it's going to be above or under. It's going to be close to it at least. Yeah, I think it. I agree. I think they're going to win over 23 races, but I'm not sure it's going to be a lot of big races. I still think like Mezgetz will pick up uh, two or three at least. Maybe he does better and he win, wins like four or five, you know, like one at Polonia. One at Bing Bank and a Grand Tour stage and a couple of others, and then you've got Dion Smith and Stannard. Maybe they pick up two Italian races apiece. Mikel Nieve should go stage hunting, I hope, uh, as well as Esteban Chavez. And then you know maybe Grandol Janssen picks out a Bing Bank Tour stage and Hamilton at Torino, and and all these things they add up, and they've got all these riders that can pick up two or three wins, and then maybe Matthews has a big haul and he could win. Uh, four or five quality races. That would be a lot for him. He, he's not been like a – it depends if the Canadian races go ahead as well. But I think they're going to win over yep. 23 races. I think they're going to have a better year than last year. Um, and they've got a lot of – they actually do have a lot of upside uh, bike exchange. Yep. I, I think I've been quite critical of them I have on this on this podcast. That being said, they've got a guy who can win a Grand Tour in Simon Yates. And they've got a guy who's capable of winning um, multiple monuments. I'm not saying, like, he, he can. Michael Matthews, he could win Milano San Remo. It's conceivable. He could win Liège. I'm not saying it's likely to win both. I think yep. Milano San Remo do well. But they've got a ride who can, and they've got a decent support staff or squad around him. So that is that is better than a lot of teams out there. Not the a lot problem of- with... The problem with the rider type of matches is that there's so much competition on the races that he is good at that it's often difficult for a team to fully trust a rider like that because there's also so much downside to it because signing matches has a lot of capabilities of getting great results, but it's also got a lot of opportunities of missing out by a tiny bit because there's so much amazing com- competition at that level. The likes of Wout van Aert is literally a pure competitor on every single terrain that matches is good at. And yeah. it's difficult to beat Van Aert. So and he's got a rough season ahead of him, I think, as well. It's going to be difficult, but I believe. Yeah, I hope he has a good year. I think he's going to win a few big races. Uh, but that's our Team Bike Exchange 2021 preview. Fair few changes, few guys out of contract uh, for after this year, Chavez and Nieve, and a couple of the younger guys, Groves, Peak, and Konishev are also out of contract. So they'll be looking to get some good results themselves to try and get extended or, or increase their value. Um, and, yeah, the veteran Andre Zeitz as well. So the Australian team, I'm glad they're still going ahead. I was glad they didn't get changed to Manuela Fundacion. Um, and, yeah, I hope they have a good year. But that's been our... Team Bike Exchange preview. Let us know down below whether you think our takes are too hot, whether they're too cold, and what your hot takes are. Follow us on Twitter at Lantern Roof Cycling Podcast, and we'll see you in the next preview. Ciao.